Do you have any any idea where this girl may be? I wish I know. Can you tell me how you told us? The house that they're standing on, and they grew up to the left. I used to stay in that house. She was everything. And for him to discard her like she was nothing, like no one would never find her. This is nine-year-old Felicia Williams. In 2014, she passed away, alone, in pain, and afraid, at the hands of strangers. Her case was not an easy one. The detectives would have to follow a complicated trail to get to a monster named Granville Ritchie, and it would take six long years to convict him. What did Ritchie do that day? And how did Felicia end up in his care in the first place? This is the full story of Felicia Williams. Did she ever talk to you about running away? She didn't tell you. On May 16th, 2014, Felicia Williams' parents phoned 911 and reported their nine year old daughter missing. The report said, Florida police are searching for a girl who is visiting her aunt at the Doral Oaks apartments on Tanglewood Place and wandered off. Felicia Williams, who lives in Yarbor City, may have left the apartment at about 5.30 p.m. while her aunt was taking a shower. Williams was wearing a black and green striped shirt, blue jeans, and black shoes. That day, Felicia was in the care of 23-year-old Ebony Wiley. She wasn't her aunt, though, just her neighbor. You tell me how you told the house that they're standing on, and they grew up to the left. I used to stay in that house. But Ebony and the Williamses had been neighbors for a while, and Felicia's parents trusted her with their children. So, the friendship is? Yeah, I made up Ebony, my goddaughter. Did you do that? Me. And her mom, Marguerite? Felicia's parents also trusted her. She might have been nine years old, but she was mature, energetic, and focused. You guys know her as Felicia. We knew her as Sugar Plum. That was our Sugar Plum. She was amazing. She was very, like, a vibrant child, very sweet. She was very loving, very caring, funny. In other words, Felicia was not the type to wander off with strangers or be fooled easily. So law enforcement's theory about her wandering off from the apartment sounded implausible to her loved ones. As they interviewed Ebony, detectives reached another name, 35-year-old Grainville Ritchie. He was a Jamaican immigrant who called himself Trevor and who had only been in the States for a short while. Also, for a very short while, he was dating Ebony. In fact, the two had a chance encounter on the street three days before Felicia's disappearance. He actually met her while he was driving down the road. Ebony actually fell in love with Granville, like from the moment that she saw him. I talked to her on the phone later on, and then we hooked up later on. The two of them got very close very quickly, and Ebony felt this was a safe space, so she started confiding in Granville. She said that she would take care of Felicia pretty often while her parents were busy working, but she wasn't happy. Felicia was acting out more and more. Ebony had just gotten a new job, and Felicia had a tendency to appear at her workplace unannounced. Ebony didn't know what to do about it. That's when I called my friend. And you called Trevor. Mm hmm And I said, um, you remember I was telling you about my God, baby, where I want you to be? He was like, yeah. I was like, I want to go there and book with a belt, because she put me in the house. Mm -hmm. Like, no, just do it the right way. You know, let's buy her something to eat. Talk to her that way. From what Ebony told the investigators, it sounded like Granville was a kind person who knew how to behave with kids. Ebony thought so too. So a few days into their romance, Ebony asked Granville if they wanted to have a day out with little Felicia. He sounded ecstatic. I picked up at her house. Did she tell her mom where you were? But not exactly where we were. Just because I'm able to trust Amy. And then you drove right from there to Checkers. I think you know, we want Checkers. My true checkers, all the food, we were food, we went by over with my mom's. The three of them drove over to Temple Terrace to Granville's mom. It was about to be a peaceful day with food and games, they said, until things took an unexpected turn. We got there chilling. Of course, me and the girl is gonna get pranked. You know what I mean? Before we go in the room, I put a movie in. We watching it, mellow down. Chilling. Both Ebony and Granville's told the same story. Once they decided to have some intimate time, they retreated into the bathroom and left Felicia watching a movie. Going to take a shower, 
Man, shower. I said, man, I'm going to you before I lay this bed. As soon as I opened the door, this girl went out on the couch. And then he came out of that room, man. Tell me where it was going. In investigations like this, detectives often look for inconsistencies in suspects' stories or stories that don't match. But Ebony and Granville told the same story. As far as they knew then and there, they were telling the truth. However, it was very unusual that a nine-year-old girl would run away from a new house into a completely unknown area. And now, I went back to the room, I said, this girl is gone. We dear, pondering, pondering, pondering. Within minutes, Ebony phoned 911. When I first got the call from my mom, she was like, Sugar Plum missing, can you help me find her? I'm like, no, I'm not helping you. She not, she not missing. I know Sugar Plum is not missing. She is on her bike somewhere at a friend house and she'll be home soon. Felicia's poor sister wanted to see a lighter scenario, but soon enough, she would find out the harsh reality and it would haunt her forever. This ain't wrong. Something wrong. This little girl done walked out the door. How long were you in your room with Trevor before you came out? About 35 minutes. What do you know about this guy? And like in what way? What's the name? What's the last name? How could you come bring this child to someone's house and rip up no one right that way? She's not too much. Yep, Ebony was all too aware that she'd known Granville for three days, and yet she chose to include him in her babysitting activities. What I feel truly happened is that she went with someone who made a bad judgment. But when Ebony asked whether Granville could be guilty in some way, she was adamant he couldn't. Her argument? I mean, couldn't have because I was in a moment. Do you know that for sure? Do I know for sure? Yes, sir. You were with him every second of time. Yes. And when the detectives asked Ebony about Felicia's behavior, she claimed she always spoke about running away from home. Did she ever talk to you about running away? Mm -hmm. The scenario was becoming even more complicated. Perhaps there was trouble at home and Felicia waited for an opportunity. But Felicia's family painted a whole different picture. Felicia was independent, but she was very close to her family. She would never plan her escape from home. And honestly, how many nine-year-olds run away from home unless there's severe trauma in the family? Do you think that she could have walked home from there? She probably could have. But she was at a new address and she had a good relationship with Ebony. Things weren't adding up. Why would Felicia suddenly abandon that kind of port that kind of harbor of safety when she's in a strange environment, all of a sudden she's just gonna walk out of the door. As both interrogations progressed, the detectives found Granville increasingly suspicious. So they decided to push Ebony. Did he tell you to say that he wasn't there? To say that his mom was there? Yeah. Say it was my mom, would you? Ebony simply complied with Granville's demand. She didn't think or dare to ask what had really happened. And that's why I said I was in the shower, she was in her room. Why lie? I got scared. I don't want to make it feel like I was an unfit godmother. Sadly, it was a little too late for that. It's pretty heartbreaking that Ebony worried more about her image than about finding Felicia and bringing her home. Meanwhile, Granville insisted Felicia was probably out and about through Florida. Somebody probably see a new girl wandering around and just thinks, let me get her. If anything happens to her, mm -hmm. We have to make sure that we can, you know, mm -hmm. somebody's got to be brought to justice. The detectives were right. Somebody would be brought to justice the hard way. One day after Felicia was reported missing, her lifeless body was found floating in Tampa Bay. That day, an officer approached the Williams house with the terrible news. He said, I'm gonna do everything in my power to make sure we find whoever did this. And my mom just broke and fell. And then from there, that's when we knew Something bad happened. Felicia hadn't just been unalived. She had been essayed and subjected to some of the worst things a human being can endure, let alone a child. You have a body that is essentially deposited in water. This individual knew that they had done something wrong. They knew that they had left potentially behind trace evidence. The water is going to wash away any kind of physical remnant that's there. This shocking piece of news affected many people. Felicia's family was devastated. The local community was scared for their own children, and the detectives were frantic. 
Someone else was touched too, Ebony. During her second interrogation, she decided to come clean. Now, she had a new layer to the story. Got in the house. See, that's when he got up and was like, Ebony, come out. We went in the kitchen, I'm like, oh, what was me? The two agreed they were in the mood to smoke, but Granville claimed he didn't know where to purchase it. So he urged Ebony to go sort it out while he stayed at home with Felicia. You gotta go, I'm gonna stay here. I was like, um, go on with me. He said, oh, well, um, um, no, I don't think she should go because you know you don't got no license and you know you better have weed in the car, so. See. Felicia trusted Granville blindly, even though she'd met him three days prior. She didn't question his theory. She just left on a silly errand, leaving Felicia all alone with this new person. She was back at the apartment in under an hour, only to find Granville idle. I got to the gate. I'm calling him, calling him, calling him. Why ain't I got to Finally, Granville picked up to tell Ebony he was at the local CVS. According to Granville, Felicia had run away and he was looking for her. When Granville returned home, he called Ebony to return too, and she saw something odd. When I was driving up, I look up, he got his shirt off. He was shirtless and sweating profusely. He claimed he was in that state because he was panicking about Felicia. He'd given her $2 to go to the store and buy some candy, but she never returned, he said. I sat down, he panicking, he panicking, he panicking. Like, go on, mama, mama, go on, break. Knowing what this man had done just minutes before saying this makes him the most disgusting kind of evil. When the detectives showed Ebony's picture from the apartment, she noticed fresh drag marks on the carpet in Granville's room. Those drag marks on the surface of the floor that police believe were consistent with a suitcase. It was leaving a tiny little indention. Ebony also noticed a suitcase on the back seat of Granville's car in another picture. A horrible picture was coming together. Then there were phone records. Through the records, Granville was tracked to the place where Felicia's body was found. There was also a white mangrove leaf in his car, and it matched a tree found right at the scene. Granville's car could not hide what he had done the day before. He was arrested and charged with first-degree murder, essay, and aggravated child abuse. Ebony was also charged with providing false information to the detectives. Justice is oftentimes frustrating in cases like Felicia's. The investigator's theory was obvious and no one could contest it. However, there was no direct evidence linking Granville to the crime. Leaves and records put him at the location. But how could prosecutors prove he'd unalived her without DNA evidence? Granville's trial began in 2019, a full five years after his arrest. He put his hands around her throat. Her. And then he took Felicia's lifeless body and he threw it like someone would throw a bag of garbage into the cold, dark waters of Tampa Bay. Forensics, phone data, a sketchy interrogation, and Ebony's testimony made up the prosecution's argument. If she walked away, if she don't ran down the street, she gonna show up. Granville's defense, however, pointed out to the lack of DNA evidence or defense marks on Granville's body. No hair, no skin, nothing. They even went as far as suggesting that Felicia's stomach turning autopsy report misinterpreted her injuries, which were in fact caused by the moving water after her death. Yeah, right. It's absolutely outlandish. That area of the body is very well protected. Finally, a 911 call was played in court. It wasn't Ebony's call, it was little Felicia in one last attempt to save herself. It was Eric's 911. She punched in the numbers 911. Someone else disconnected the phone. Although there was no DNA evidence, one thing was clear. Felicia met a horrible end, alone, afraid, and in excruciating pain betrayed by her beloved babysitter. In 2020, there was a verdict. We have your respondents called as to count one of the charge and it's given the first degree murder as charge. Granville Ritchie was found guilty on all counts. She was everything. And for him to discard her like she was nothing, like no one would never find her, it hurt. At age 41, Granville was sentenced to death. Ebony Wiley pled guilty to her charge and was sentenced to 75 days in jail. 
the prosecution did not find her responsible for Felicia's death. The Williams family feels differently, though. I feel like her sentence was a slap on the wrist. She was the main reason to why we're here. It's very unfair. Granville never offered an apology. He stood poker-faced throughout his trial and accepted his fate. Still, he didn't really accept his sentence. In November 2021, his name made headlines again as he tried to appeal his sentence. His attorney claimed that the prosecutor had asked the jury to empathize with Felicia, and that went against the so-called golden rule. This is what prosecutor Scott Harmon said in 2020. Can you imagine the dread of knowing that your life is ending and you are feeling pain all over your body? That pain would have been greater for a little girl. It's hard to believe this wouldn't stand as an argument in a case so callous. As of autumn 2023, Granville is still trying to appeal his sentence and the judge is trying to avoid a do-over of his sentence. It is so heartbreaking to see how this man has zero empathy or remorse for taking an innocent life. He's putting all of his energy into getting off of death row, but not an ounce of energy into apologizing to Felicia's poor family. Imagine having to live with this story for the rest of your life, knowing you left your much-loved daughter or sister in the care of someone you trusted, only to be betrayed in the worst way imaginable. Whichever way Granville's appeal goes, he will spend the rest of his life behind bars. However, this does little to alleviate the pain of her grieving family. Thanks for watching, you guys. What are your thoughts on this tragic case? Do you know similar stories? Let me know in a comment, and before you leave, make sure you like and subscribe. See you next time.